Um, yes, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. I'm Adam Hurt, uh, as was mentioned. And this is going to be a, a fairly high level talk about neuromorphic computing. Um, I will start just giving a brief overview of what neuro neuromorphic computing actually is, then go into the details about what the Human Brain Project uh, is developing, which is both brain scales and Spinnaker. Um, I'll also briefly touch on event-based cameras, which is a good example of devices which are being developed which lend themselves very well to integration with neuromorphic platforms, um, before eventually going into genetic algorithms, which is what I'm currently working on as part of Spinnaker, um, and then summarizing. So as has been mentioned, there's many sub-projects of the Human Brain Project, which I surprisingly am part of the neuromorphic computing platform, SP9. So a good place to start is to actually explain what neuromorphic computing actually is. And in a very basic sense, it's just producing computers which are like brains. So it's taking the dynamics and the way neurons interact um, and neurotransmitters and trying to, to take that computational power and put it into hardware uh, for various uses. Um, so this all stems from uh, both neuroscience and computation. So all of this has to start with computers. So they're obviously very good for a data analysis, as we've heard in, in previous talks. Um, also good for, for modeling brains. So there's the, the C. elegans, which you can see in the top corner here. It's one of the, the smallest nervous systems that we've actually been able to map. Um, and even though it's only 302 neurons, there's actually been some um, experimentation where it's been used to balance an inverted pendulum. So this is the, the same techniques that's, that's used when you, you put a broom on your hands and you're trying to balance it. So just using the, the small nervous system of a tiny little worm here, they've been able to produce some quite amazing tasks. And then when you compare that to the mouse brain and the human brain, which are just magnitudes bigger, um, they become much more complicated and much harder to actually use. Um, but then this, this is all beneficial and we've used to then build models of what neurons actually are. So in the bottom right hand corner you can see a perceptron which is one of the very basic uh, computational units. So it works in a very simple way where the inputs uh, are taken and multiplied by some weight uh, and then summed together. And this sum is then passed through an activation function here which could be something as simple as a threshold or something more complicated. And this produces an output, which on its own could be useful or can then be passed into other perceptrons, eventually building up complexity. And this is how deep neural networks work. So they have many layers that all feed into each other, um, feed forward information, eventually building up very rich complexity. And this is part of what the Human Brain Project is really about, is the, the, the co-learning of the different sides, using computers, learning more about the brain, and then using that to develop um, uh, computational tools. So as I briefly go into deep neural networks, one of the, the most publicized uh, deep neural nets is AlphaGo. So the game uh, Go is a 19 by 19 board where two players play against each other and can place either a white uh, counter or a black counter depending on which player they are. Um, which obviously leads to a, a staggering amount of potential game states where it's 19 by 19 and two to the power of that number. So there's actually more potential game states than there are atoms in the universe. So just staggering. Um, and conventional game uh, solvers or game players use uh, a tree search process, which is what uh, AlphaGo does. But it also uh, attaches some, you could almost call it intuition, with this deep neural network, or convolutional deep neural network. So there's a, a diagram at the bottom here of um, a convolutional net, which isn't the one used in AlphaGo, this is just used for MNIST digit recognition. But the same principles apply in that you've got a large amount of feature extraction in this, uh, in this section, which is where the majority of your layers are, and the same in AlphaGo, um, which then extract the features of your game boards, or in the example at the bottom, of the character, and then that's passed into a classification layer which then decides either the move or guesses the digit that has been passed in. So this is quite amazing. It's one of the, the most uh, impressive things to come out of AI, which is why it's got a lot of publicity. But compared to biological systems, it's, it doesn't really translate. Although in the, the visual cortex there is a large amount of feed forward, um, there's still feedback, but deep neural nets only feed forward information 
and backpropagate the errors. So the errors between the output of the network and the um, desired output, so in this example, what the digit should be, is then fed back through the network, which is very powerful and can do some very impressive tasks, but isn't actually biologically plausible. So compared to the, the biological structure, um, there's as much feedback as the read is feed forward, which uh, allows for a much more computational complexity and more power uh, from the network. But it's much harder to train these networks because um, as soon as you start feeding back, the training becomes more difficult. You can't use back propagation because you end up with loops. Um, and there's no real solid way for actually developing these, these complicated networks. Um, and when you compare this to mammalian brains uh, specifically, they're, they're huge networks which are much bigger than deep neural networks. Um, and they can also tackle a wide range of tasks. So AlphaGo was very specific in the tasks that it did. And it did manage to beat human counterparts, even the, the world champion in Go. But a simple change of the board size, moving from a 19 by 19 board to an 18 by 18 board, renders it completely useless. And obviously then I can't, I can't use the same, uh, the same agent to, to play chess. It's very specific to that one certain task. And that's generally the current state of, of artificial intelligence as it is right now. Um, also, it needs many more training examples, like thousands and millions of generated examples, which admittedly it can process a lot faster than the human brain. But um, it's a lot harder to, to get enough training samples, especially when you're, you're doing certain other tasks, like um, medical image classification, or uh, even other ones talked about where certain uh, images of the brain, like gathering enough data to really be useful for training deep neural nets is very difficult. There's also a lot of um, priors in the brain. So this is information that uh, uh, is already in there. So for example, um, if I have a key, I know that the key opens a lock. Like it seems very intuitive and humans are very good at this, but compared to um, machine learning agents, it, they they don't have this information inherent at all. So a good example of this is this paper called Investigating Human Plies for Playing Video Games. So they developed a very simple game where you can look at that and it's quite obvious that you've got to climb the ladder, you jump over the fire, climb up the other ladder, and kill or jump over this bad guy to then save the princess. Very easy, this is all, all very intuitive to a human. But as soon as you start taking away the semantics, so you no longer can easily see that it's a ladder or a fire, it becomes more difficult until eventually you've stripped away all qualities of the game. Um, they even did a, a later experiment where, as well as these, these more complicated things where they removed the semantics and the, the texture of the background, they also rotated the game by 90 degrees, inverted gravity, uh, and switched the left and the right arrow, um, which essentially rendered it impossible for a human to actually accomplish. Um, as you can see here, when you, you change and remove these priors, becomes much more difficult for a human to um, complete them. So uh, the deaths are actually divided by two, and the states are actually divided by a 1,000, just for simplicity of the, the, the graph. But then when you compare this to uh, a reinforcement learning agent, there's almost no difference when you take away the semantics or affordances, because it doesn't have these priors that human has. That it doesn't make any difference. The only difference that really comes from is removing similarity. So. Um, you could see in the, the previous slide that when you remove similarity, the ladder here and the ladder here are different colours. And this makes intuitive sense that it would be more difficult for it to learn because uh, it's no longer just learning the property of a ladder, that the pink block is a ladder. It then has to learn it again, so this does increase the, the complexity of the task. And I think the most important thing to take from this is that brains are incredibly complex. It's not the machine learning agents are stupid in any way, but there's a lot of information in there that um, we take for granted. And this is where neuromorphic platforms comes in, because it's trying to, to really take the qualities of the brain and use that to accomplish um, more advanced tasks. So there's a, a number of different platforms being developed. Uh, there's True North, Leohi, and Neurogrid. Um, these are all outside of the, the Human Brain Project. Um, and the exact specifics of how they work is, is a bit of a secret, especially with, with uh, Intel's. But the ones I'm going to focus on are BrainScales and Spinnaker, which are both developed in the Human Brain Project.
So brain scales, um, it works by emulating the brain dynamics. So as compared to simulation, emulation um, doesn't care about the, or doesn't model the intricacies of, of neuromodulators and ion channels. All it does is try to, to model the, the function from the input, the output of the neuron. So that's, that's what brain scales does, is it, it has uh, this ADEX, which is adaptive exponential neuron, um, which is a mathematical model of how a neuron reacts depending on the input. And this is all then put into hardware, um, which, allows the, the, uh, which allows brain scales to emulate uh, vast amounts of neurons. And um, we can do this in a ridiculous speed as well, of 10,000 times real time, which, as written here, it means that five years of child development can be done in five hours, which is staggering when you think of the, the possibilities. Um, can also do up to 200,000 neurons per wafer and 44 million synapses. There's some adaptability depending on uh, exactly how we're doing it, but, but that's a, a general number. Um, also, uh, they use a four-bit weight resolution, which may seem like a small amount, but um, there's actually been some evidence that shows it doesn't need to be that precise. So here there's a, a brief video. If it will play, will it play? Yeah, here we go. So this is um, just a, a simulated visual view of uh, brain scale. So that was just one transistor. Um, and it will slowly zoom out and show you the, the real scale of uh, brain scales, um, which I think is just, it's staggering because you can still see that little red dot and eventually it becomes huge numbers. Um, and this is all simulated. And this, these are literally like nanometer transistors. But as you zoom out, you can see that all of these transistors are, are very intricately wired, and this is all done autonomously as well to eventually make up the huge wafer that is brain scales. You can actually see here there's, there's parts that are done by hand. So obviously a very high-tech production procedure but um, still using uh, an etching bath, which is um, used by hand, and then you'll see afterwards that he even then pulls it out and rinses it um, to... Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and then here he's rinsing it. Um, so this is obviously all done in a, a sterile environment, and there's still the autonomous part done here. So the majority of it is autonomous. And this, this all makes up the entire brain scales wafer. So this is uh, one wafer, which, as I mentioned before, is up to 200,000 neurons. And it's surrounded by um, other computational units, such as FPGAs, which produce this, uh, this rack that allows it to communicate with other wafers um, and also with a computer. So the, the whole uh, cabinet is made up of uh, four racks per cabinet, and then there's five cabinets in total. So this is uh, up to about four million neurons that can be, can be modeled within brain scales. Um, and there's a number of examples. The, the main ones uh, are uh, more detailed. It's, it's more about the, the speeding up that brain scales offers, so this increased speed up to 10,000 times. So there's been some experimentation where they've moved previously trained networks, so deep neural nets that, that perform other tasks, translated them onto brain scales, um, and a slight bit of tweaking can actually get the networks to run uh, much faster than um, they would in the simulated environment. So obviously on computers it becomes much more difficult. It's also been a Sudoku solver. Um, so Sudoku, the game, I'll go into that a bit later. Um, but generally it's still kind of in development. There's, there's, uh, it's more kind of neural models that are being developed. Um, and there is a second generation one coming along. Um, which the details are a bit, a bit complicated, but generally there's going to be um, more complicated neural models, uh, multi-compartment models, um, active dendrites and plasticity processes, which all together means that the computational power of brain scales is going to increase in the next generation. Because at the moment it's, it's, uh, it's speed factor that's the most impressive, but it's going to become uh, more accurate. So then to move on to Spinnaker, um, in contrast to brain scales, it doesn't emulate, it simulates. So uh, all of the communication is done between cores, so small packets of information that represent spikes, like in a spiking neural network. Um, that is what's passed digitally in the hardware. Um, and then the, 
the computation on top of that is all done digitally. So this allows for uh, whatever model you want, really. This, the, the, the actual models are coded in C. The, the main interface is done in Pine. But if you wanted to add in some new learning rule or a new way that it can react to neurotransmitters, this can all be done um, digitally. Um, and also, uh, it may not run it 10,000 times. It runs in real time, which could be a problem. But uh, it therefore lends itself quite well to robotic tasks. So this can actually be used in real time to control robots. I uh, use slightly different neural models as well. So there's the LIF, or the Leaky Integrating Fire, and the Azikovich, um, which is slightly different. And the, the scale is very different compared to brain scales. So brain scales was up to about 4 million, um, whereas the, the Spinnaker cabinet that I'll show you later can actually model up to 1 billion neurons. Um, so here you can, you can see the scale of, of Spinnaker. Um, so as I said, up to 1 billion neurons and up to 1,000 synaps synapses each. Um, so although in biology they can actually go up to about 10,000 synapses, um, you can do this on Spinnaker, but uh, you then have to reduce the amount of neurons that can be modeled per core because essentially the neurons are connected and the synapses are put together. So if I wanted to model, uh, say, 2,000 synapses, then it would have to uh, lend synapses from another neuron. Um, so this can, means that it could potentially model up to 1% of the human brain, although because there's many more synapses, maybe not actually 1%, and the same with the, the mouse brains as well. Um, and if you remember back to C. elegans, there was only 300 new, 302 neurons, that means it could actually model over 3 million of those. So to kind of put it in perspective, um, there's a small diagram here showing all the different neuron counts for, for various animals. Obviously this is on average. Um, and then brain scales fits in about here. So this is between a uh, honeybee and a frog. And then Spinnaker in here, about, which is about one billion, between a cat and a macaque. Um, it's also worth noting that just because it's got more neurons doesn't mean it's more complex. Um, doesn't mean that an elephant is three times smarter than a human, because obviously there's, there's a lot more going on rather than just neuron count. It's the way that they communicate with each other. It's the way the information is processed. Um, so then here, another video. Okay, so this is uh, just showing how the, the Spinnaker machine is put together. So as mentioned on another slide, um, each chip is made up of 18 cores, and then the, the standard board, the, especially the one that goes into the server, is a 48 chip board. Um, and then all of these are attached in parallel. So they're all, they're all connected in the toroidal shape, which you may remember from a previous slide. And this allows for the shortest communication between chips, which is obviously very important. Um, they're all packaged and wired and arranged in certain ways that reduces the, the length of the wire between um, uh, all connected nodes. And uh, these are actually surprisingly all connected by hand. So um, all of those wires that you can see in the diagram, and you'll see soon um, with them putting it together, is actually all done by hand. It's quite a labor of love. So initially, it'd have to all be connected to coolers, obviously, because they produce a lot of heat. And then uh, three people will have headphones on, uh, and there's also lights on the little boards, and this will instruct them where to put the cables. Um, so one light will flash in one place, they'll attach one half of the cable, and then to another board. Um, so eventually, the whole thing's wired up. And there's also uh, uh, procedures that are going on in the background as well to make sure they are connecting the right boards and um, in the right areas. And all in all, I think this took about four and a half hours for them to put together. So you can see here, this is how they, they automatically check to make sure it's all working. All right. um, and then you can see Spinnaker's use around the globe. So we're in almost every continent apart from South America. So if you are from South America or know someone from South America, get into contact, we'd love to tick that box. Um, there's two different types of boards. There's the 4-node board and the 48-node board. Um, the 4-node board's more used for, for robotics and the 48-node board um, for large-scale systems. Um, you can also remotely connect to the server. You don't need to have your own board. So you can remotely connect to the server that was shown in the, the, previous, um, the previous slide in the video. Spinker's got a good few applications. Um, so the more practical ones, Again, there's a Sudoku solver, there's Conway's Game of Life, which is quite a standard. Um, there's the Spinnaker model, which is just a great pun. Um, 
And one of the things that's really amazing about the Spinnaker model is uh, it actually models the, the way that the ear controls sound and then also models the hairs and how they react to any certain frequency. But this isn't then computed and passed into the Spinnaker board. All of this computation is actually done on the Spinnaker board. So all you have to do is pass in the audio file. And because Spinnaker is so adaptable, um, the board can actually process the information as well. It's also the push block, which I'll show later. Um, and Pac-Man was uh, developed as well to play Pac-Man. It was a fairly simple model. So Pac-Man, um, it was more that the, the board controlled the little Pac-Man agent. It wasn't playing the game, so it didn't see the whole board. It uh, only saw uh, one or two squares around it. So it did produce good behavior, but obviously if it, if it hits the cherry or the, the big dot as shown in this diagram, um, it can't then chase after the ghost unless the ghost is right next to it, but still very impressive controller. So then there's the, the Sudoku solver, um, which has been developed. So I'm sure most of you know the game, but it's, uh, the general rule is that uh, a number can't be in the same column or row or square. So then the way that the, the whole grid is represented is uh, nine layers, so each layer represents a whole number. So one grid for nine, one grid for eight. Um, and as soon as one number is in uh, a position, all other uh, numbers in that row or column, so a nine is selected in one color, uh, one uh, position, all nines in that column and row and square are inhibited. So this means that the neuron is making it harder for other neurons in that area to, to fire. And then essentially, once um, uh, it, it's constantly evolving with time, so it's, it's all down to the highest firing rate determines uh, what number is in a position. And eventually this, this kind of leads to a solution. So in the bottom corner here, you can see how the entropy changes with time. So it's constantly up and down because it's constantly a uh, changing system until eventually um, it changes and then it reaches blue. So there's, there's still an element of changing after that, but it's then settled on the right solution and it's just more kind of fine tuning the last few digits. So this is all, again, done on Spinnaker. Um, and uh, it, it's actually comparable in speeds to some of the mathematical solvers that have been developed. There's then also the next generation Spinnaker chip as well. So to compare it to Spinnaker 1, um, there's about eight times as many cores, um, which use a uh, different arm core as, core as well, which means that it's moving from fixed point precision to floating precision point, um, which essentially means that it can be more accurate um, if necessary, so for certain tasks it's actually beneficial. There's more memory on the core, uh, more memory um, of the chip. It still uses about the same amount of power. They're also adding in random number generators and machine learning accelerators um, uh, actually within the chip. So random number generator is pretty obvious. Machine learning accelerators are um, certain algorithms that allow it to do matrix multiplication much faster, which is useful for um, certain networks. And then elementary functions is things like multiply into the power of, which again is very useful to have on the board. And I'm going to briefly talk about frame-based vision. Um, so this lends itself very well to uh, neuromorphic platforms because compared to frame-based models where each frame is a new image that has to be processed, features have to be extracted, um, and it's just a very high data load, event-based cameras don't have frame rates. So if it was viewing an image, regardless of what it was, and it was static, there would be no information coming through. Uh, it only tracks the changes in contrast. So it's, it's a, a silicon retina that just measures the light intensity. And if it changes by enough, then it will register an event, um, which can then obviously be translated into spikes and passed into um, some neuromorphic hardware. So here you can see in this video, this is a video, this is a slam bench video also developed at Manchester. Um, you can see that this, so this isn't actually an event-based camera, this is a normal video has been translated into uh, event-based information. So the, the green lines and the red lines represent changes in contrast. So if, if you look at the wall, you can see that the wall is almost uh, monochrome. There's no real changes apart from, from cracks in the walls, which means that a large amount of information is being removed. Also, when the image is more static, there's, there's less color, there's less change, which again means less information that needs to be processed. Um, so this is, this is also much closer to the way that the retina works in the brain, um, or within the brain, that it's, it's more about tracking the changes. It doesn't take all the information. 
Um, and then there's also an implementation, implementation in, in a push bot. So this one's actually using an event-based camera. Um, and you can see that when the robot isn't moving, all of the background disappears um, because there's no longer any change. But as it tries to track the light source, um, there is change. You can then start seeing uh, objects in the background. And uh, the light is constant through this because it is flashing. So it's up at, uh, about 1,000 kilohertz. So much faster than um, frame-based video, but um, because event-based doesn't have frames, you can process this a lot easier. And one good application for this sort of uh, hardware is self-driving cars. So say, for example, uh, the car is driving down the road and someone crosses from behind another car. So you couldn't see it until it appeared in the road. With frame-based uh, video, you'd have to wait until the next frame that the person appears in which can really drastically reduce the reaction time of the onboard computer. But when using event-based, it can react instantaneously. It doesn't have to wait for the next frame. Um, and it can then be passed in. It's also low computation low, which means easier for computation. Um, and can also lead to potentially saving lives. Um, but one of the main obstacles in this is the fact that uh, cameras are a standard right now. There's a lot of uh, complementary hardware and software that goes with them. Um, but event-based are slowly building traction. So now I'm going to briefly talk about the work that I'm doing, which is using genetic algorithms um, to construct spiking neural networks. So the first step is to define the solution space. So this is the properties that you're going to allow it to control. So this can be the, the structure, the neuron type, whether the neuron is excitatory or inhibitory, um, essentially anything you want. Um, and this, this is just randomly coded within the genes. Uh, to start anyway. Uh, and then you define the fitness function. So this is the, the function that uh, defines how well an agent is performing. So it can either be for a low error rate or um, anything you want, basically. Uh, and then you apply evolutionary rules. So in the same way that, that Darwin described, it's all about survival of the fittest. So if an agent has a higher fitness, it's therefore more likely to mate. Um, and then the child is then slightly mutated in some way, and if that child has a higher fitness, it's uh, then more likely to mate. And this is all repeated continuously um, until you reach some, some end criteria, which can either be a certain level of fitness or uh, a certain number of iterations completed. So I did a, a, a brief experiment um, recently, which was to evolve an agent to move towards a light source. So it only had six neurons, two of which received inputs from the light source, um, and two of which controlled the motor, or the, the wheel, so one neuron for each wheel. Um, and then only evolving the connections, the weights, and the delays between neurons, it could then fairly quickly, so this, this behavior you can see here is only from a few generations. So each graph is, is one particular agent, um, and it's an overlap of two experiments. So in the first experiment, uh, the light source was on the left, and it would slowly go towards that and circle around it. Um, and the other one, the light source on the right. So all I did was, was give it uh, free reign on, on these parameters and gave it a fitness function which said that it performed better if it went towards the light. So very basic. I, I had to give it very little information. And just through a few generations, um, it managed to perform or, or managed to generate behavior. So it's, it can be quite crude in the way that it works. Um, so near the start of my procedures, I actually, I messed up the parameters that I was going to give it, um, and actually generated a network of fully inhibitory neurons. So any spike from a neuron should have made it more difficult for other neurons to spike. But because it was taking advantage of the hardware, and it knew that if it spiked fast enough, it could wrap around uh, the number of bits until eventually it was actually exciting other neurons, um, it managed to, to, to generate relatively good behavior, not as good as, as these two, but um, considering how the network was just horribly wrong, it still managed to produce some, some fairly good behavior. Um, and I think that's the thing with, with GAs, is they can generate very novel architecture, and uh, they, they bring a lot of information from biology, because obviously our brains evolved, so it almost seems to lend itself that um, uh, genetic algorithms can be used to evolve network architectures as well. So to conclude, um, neuromorphic hardware presents a great task, a great uh, tool for us to use 
to be able to model and generate new networks. Um, there's also development of uh, auxiliary uh, devices which can be attached to it, such as event-based cameras. There's also silicon cochlears which are being developed, so that's the, the auditory um, sense. And there's a number of uh, optimization algorithms, um, of which the one that, that I'm most favored on is uh, evolutionary algorithms. And hopefully this can all lead to uh, further development of uh, tools which can help us. So um, this could be things like Siri on your phone, could uh, be more adaptive and more reactive, um, use less power because neuromorphic hardware only uses a watt compared to your phone, which uses vastly more than that. Um, and generally just it seems to, to be the future. At least that's, obviously I'm biased in that opinion, but that seems to be the way it's going. Um, and then there's references, and thank you for listening.